and I was uh, going in the kitchen of my mother, selecting a plate. So just I was choosing, yeah, I was going, so getting the plates out and check out uh, which plate I could use because the original center airfoil rib was 372 centimeters long and I was searching for a plate which would make a good nose radius and I was then... Hi everyone, I hope you're well. It looks like the last video which was Hannes Papesh about paraglider design went quite well uh, but unfortunately I had to cut it a bit because otherwise it would be too long. The full talk was four hours long. Uh, but there's another part of it which is this one which is Hannes' story so far and how he got into paragliding which intertwines really well with the history of paragliding itself and how the whole thing came about and what it was like in the early days. So uh, I thought it would be too good to, to miss and you guys might appreciate it. So uh, I just want to say sorry, I had some camera issues, we'll see what I mean. Hopefully it's not too bad because it's all about the audio on this one. Um, and as always I want to say a big thank you to these people up front for supporting the channel. Uh, if you're interested in these videos don't forget to subscribe to the channel and maybe sponsor us on Patreon if you're interested. And uh, I'll leave you with Hannes and the history of paragliding. Yeah, so I'm Hannes, you've seen it uh, on this here, I'm not sponsored, but I'm from Austria, not from Germany. So a, a short introduction, let's go. Who knows, who's been in Austria already? already? Yeah, plenty. So you would find it on the map. <clears throat> oh, it's marked red, so... What's, what's the grey beside? Switzerland. Yeah, Switzerland. Yeah, good. And, and this here? <laughs> yeah, Carlo, Carlo should uh, polish his Italian. His, his father is from this area here. And, yeah. We came all along the way from Tyrol, so we are from the western part of Austria, and we came all the way, we went through Switzerland, visited some schools, and then we went through France to Great Britain, and there we already made quite a big tour, and now we're here to visit you. And we may talk about the story, history of paragliding, but first maybe a short introduction about the history of me. I was born in 65. Who's older? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was once one of the youngest ones. So I was, at the beginning I was quite young, 21 years. And yeah, this, so lots of other pilots were much older. But now it's slowly swapping, switching. And uh, the glider I have been beginning, like many others were uh, the Rondonese Maxi in 86. Yeah, as a, I began just not on my own, so I was just called by my uncle to drive the car because that, as, at that time paragliding was different and we had to go up the hill quite often. And so he was remembering that I already have my driving license and so I came into paragliding just from being a driver and then I wanted to fly it myself as well. And yeah, I was a biology student and somebody studied biology. No, it's not a really wise decision because you won't earn money. It's quite hard to get a job. And it was the studio, the, these studies were very frequent at that time. And yeah, but this was later my, discuss, my decision not to keep on studying further on. But my first in, dream was of course because I couldn't afford my own wing and I wanted to have a, a wing of good design and good performance at that time that the, wing, the wings developed quite fast so after a short attempt to get my studies a little bit pushed as I went to Vienna but this attempt failed because Vienna is a city with maybe you know big city not as big as London maybe uh, it's 1.8 million and for me as a, as a child of the mountains I felt quite lost in the big city 
So I returned and I decided, okay, let's try to design and build my own paraglider. I lent the sewing machine of my mother and I got some cheap red and slippery cloths and some other classes from a friend of mine, Elmar von Blown, who was doing harnesses. And I had problems getting the materials, so I had to use materials you normally use for these things inside. And <laughs> so not really specialized uh, paragliding or parachuting material, because I didn't get support of anybody. So I was, I sitting, I was sitting down programming a software to calculate the sail cut on a Commodore 128 already, so not the 6.4, but the 128, because my, my pocket job was too small, so it needed more memory. And I thought at that time uh, this kind of software would be quite common, but could be that it was a, a step forward. Maybe except ITV, uh, they had really, really good uh, tools and possibilities, the original ITV, so they were a step forward in that matter, located in Annecy. But yeah, I was just a little, also a young designer guy in the Alps, in the west part of, the east part of, part of the Alps, where the sport was mainly located in the west part. So, but I was programming the software and later spending a lot of time to draw the patterns and because of if you see yourself working for plenty of weeks you want to have finally a result which is positive so I, I had something like a risiko management I was I want to be sure that the wing is finally flying so I was, I was measuring an airfoil of a parachute more or less and changing it a little bit and I didn't have any education in this matter, but my father was very, very flying addicted. But at that time he was not living anymore for a long time, because he was not dying in an accident by flying, he was dying in an avalanche. He was an engineer, and I would have loved to do it with him, but he was, not, I was seven years old as I lost him. So I, I got a lot of uh, flying... Uh, uh, feelings or ideas, or I got the, I got his flying enthusiasm f from the very first days of my childhood. So my, I had I still had the magazines of him. He, he collected for model airplane construction, and he was constructing model airplanes. And he died too early to get into the hang gliding scene. He died in '73, so I'm sure he would have begun hang gliding because sailplane flying was too expensive, so he couldn't afford. He was beginning of 30 as he, he died, so maybe later he could have had hang gliding or sailplane flying, but quite sure paragliding. But okay, I had to do it on my own and I was checking out how the air forest look on parachutes and got the, got, got the rough idea. It was a quite straight forward airfoil, so really straight, so the bottom sail was straight like on the Clark Epsilon. And the rear part, among uh, from maybe 50 percent on, I have to check, was also straight, so built quite simple. Normally, you have these straight bottom uh, sides for model airplanes because it's easy to to uh, <coughs> to construct the wing or the place to wing or fix the wing. And yeah, and the new thing was it was the rumor around, or it was yeah. Uh, to have maybe the intake closed, because the designs at that time looked different. So a very good pilot of our area had already flown a world record with gliders like that. So this was not the very first generation, it was the second generation on the basis of uh, original ITV design. And you see that the, the gliders had a tuck tail and a more uh, a smaller intake and a higher lift airfoil and with a copy of those gliders he was able to fly 65 kilometers from Innsbruck west. This was, but this was not done with my proto, with my proto, it was done with a glider like that. And w later with my design they were flying I think 150 something, but in the States, in 
uh, Owens Valley or so, some, somewhere. So just straight, straight distance. But the Innsbruck was at that time already a location for a world record. So as you, as you may know, the actual uh, FIE three angle record, or one of the last records, three hundred and forty FIE three angle was flown in Zillertal, so quite close. Mm -hmm. So the area where we are from was proven to be very good for this kind of flights, especially three angles. And interesting wise, they're flying very big three angles south of the Alps and north of the Alps, so it's not needed to cross the main ridge so far. But we are expecting to have huge flights when the pilots manage to cross the main ribs, the main ridge. But you have to cross it twice, and on some normally it's yeah, 2,500 meters at the lower points, so it's it's quite tricky. But performance is developing further on, and so we may see a really really huge uh, FI FIE triangle soon. Maybe this this uh, summer because the average speeds are increasing. They already have around 32 kilometers per hour. So in June, June when there's a long flying uh, time possible, we may see a new world record this year. Let's see. But yeah, this was the state of the art design at that time. Maybe later with closed uh, wing tips. So this is Benny, by the way. It's one of our. Uh, test pilots and he is a flying school kid so he began in the age of six <laughs> and it's like skateboarding when you learn it from the from the very small shoes on you're just a step ahead so he's a flying genius for our uh, this is flying everything so three axes hang gliders trikes motor gliders paragliders whatever it's doing well. He's doing very well, whatever he does. And the newer designs, yeah, not even those. They have they had some closed cell cells in the wing tips, but still the very big open intakes in the middle. And as I was thinking about my glider, I, I thought, okay, let's just try something new. And I was. Uh, Going in the kitchen of my mother, selecting a plate. So just I was choosing, yeah, I was going, so getting the plates out and check out uh, which plate I could use because the original center airfoil rib was 372 centimeters long, and I was searching for a plate which would make a good nose radius, and I was then <laughs> taking this plate and drawing uh, the, a line around it. I was measuring it, was scaling it down, because I didn't do it easy, I made an elliptical ground shape. So the gliders of that time didn't have really elliptical ground shapes, and I made this. And as well, I didn't make it easy, because I, I put plenty of ribs in the wing, so I had suspended ribs, unsus unsuspended ribs in the middle, and the very first one, this one, already had 19 cells. So the, early, the very early designs, like the Maxi, had just nine cells. So this one, 19 cells. And because I wanted to be really, really working a lot, I made the unsuspended ribs from mesh. So not from, from tissue, from ripstop, but from mesh, which made it very difficult to sew because diagonal mesh is stretching a lot. And so I had to draw lots of marking points to have an accurate shape and don't lose the, the length by sewing it. But with all these uh, difficulties, I learned pretty good to, to sew uh, these kind of materials. And I was also uh, developing a new kind of sewing the leading edge because it was much more difficult to sew the leading edge around the round uh, airfoil than just to have an open one. With an open one, it's just an edge. It's easy, but there you had to had to round to to sew to sew around a, a small radius, which is normally not as easy because the the panels run quite straight and the, the airfoil is, of course, running a round curve. Good. So I was programming. I was drawing the patterns. I began to cut the cloth. I was sewing. The panels and so I was working from 
January to May. And yeah, then the first flight on the training hill. So we, we have on, on a few hills like you have here. And we've seen, yeah, it's flying. We had some problems with the Stabilo. So my uncle was still with me, helping me. The Stabilo was rum air with um, airfoils in it. And they were flapping. And, but we, we corrected that. And we already experienced, yeah, performance seems to be good. And at that time, Andre Bucher, the one we've been talking about, who held the world, the world record, just came back from the Europeans. He got second, but he got only second because he had a crash in the last task, or the task before the last one. And there were some pictures around of him. He was a tall guy, very athletic, with a two meter, I don't know, 50 long paragliding uh, pack on his shoulder because his competition gliders, glider had glass fiber sticks all over the length of the airfoil. So he, could, he couldn't pack it. So that's, it's like a wheel, you know, it's because we were at that time lucky to get rid of the sticks. Sticks were there already and now we come back to the quite rigid sticks. But <clears throat> we can talk about it later. It, it, maybe it would make sense as we had a discussion some years ago where Sozone was coming up with the carbon sticks to split the classes, to have soft paragliders and rigid paragliders. Could be, but we, we will discuss about this a little later. But at that time, sticks were present, were quite common. And André had a high aspect ratio glider with glass fiber and sticks. But he was noticing that my red egg, we called it egg because it had very low aspect ratio, was performing pretty, pretty well. So, and we, we finally did some comparison flights and the red egg was outperforming the hot chip and he was that much impressed that we got the school owner of our neighborhood, Ernst Steger, who was producing little quantities of copied wings for his own demand. We got him to produce the wing in Syria. And we didn't think about that it will get that much success. So I think it's still the design of mine who was selling in the highest numbers. So, I don't know, 5,000. And we had, it was copied several times and we helped other brands. Or, or on the, 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 Ernst Steger was just uh, surprised and not really able to handle this, this demand the request of the of the all the pilots that wanted to have a wing like those there is a history there is a story he wanted to produce gliders in israel and i spent some weeks to draw original patterns two set of wooden patterns and we sent, we were sent it to apco but apco was not producing for him finally but they started their own paraglider production on their own so we we helped apco to step into the market and there were several, immediately there were several wings around which had this design. Okay, but for me it was not uh, economically successful because I had no really insight in what's going on. I was just a very young, still very young student and so I stepped out of this agreement and yeah, plenty of people were interested after this uh, introduction or it could have been a, a, a one-hit wonder but some sort it's it would be interesting to work with me and I had to select among different offers but after some meetings I decided to go with a, a guy who was been introduced by a colleague of the club and so we founded Nova a year later who remembers Nova? Yeah, some, okay. Yeah, with Nova, I have been there for 25 years, but then I stepped off because as when you're just young and unexperienced, you don't really know that the decisions you do will last so long and you still have to handle the same persons 25 years later and but the persons are developing and 
So for me, it was finally time to do something else in 2017. But step by step, uh, the first real international attention as NOVA, we got with the NOVA Phantom, is, is this wing here. Uh, somebody remembers? Did you already fly at that time? Yes. It was, it's, I think it's still a pretty wing. Uh, lots of cells, we had 45, 47 cells with no, in, uh, no ribs, uh, no unsuspended ribs, every rib suspended, which made a clean shape. Uh, looking back to, to today's uh, relationships, it, they, it had a lot of line meters, but it showed good performance and we had a world record and later we made good <coughs> places at the world championship in San Andre with Tony and Urs Hari. And this was the first time I think the gliders of mine came to Britain, except my very first design, but nobody, nobody knew that I was the designer of the CX. So, of course, as soon as I stepped off this agreement, they said they were designing them it, it themselves, of course. So I was, but this Nova advertised with my name, which was good for me later, so I was able to get a name and yeah with the Phantom we had the very the very first success internationally and got already a little bigger as we thought. So we thought the first time we just we were going to sell 150 gliders in the club neighborhood. But with this uh, international successes we've seen that yeah they may get some some hundreds. And we were establishing our own factory in Hungary, and we were growing fast. We already had some problems, I will show you later. The glider Phoenix really had to show that its name was true because it was already almost dead and got uh, to life again. And this was a lucky uh, situation because it could have been easily happened that Nova would have been dying just two years after foundation. But we survived, and later we got quite f early, we, we were very, very successful in the competition. So we are focusing on competition uh, gliders because it was a chance for us to get, to get known and to, to, to prove our uh, technical competence, to demonstrate our technical competence. So competition makes it makes it quite easy to overrule or some or market, marketing because there you really have to show so marketing is sometimes only blah 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 we, we, we uh, tell that in german but in the comps you see what's true so it, the promises have to be proven and this was the good thing in the early days even with the cx so in in 88 it was easy to sell the wing because you, you, just, you just had to uh, visit people. You were asking who's the best pilot, who's got the best glider. Okay, let's go for a comparison. And the distance, uh, the difference was that huge that it was easily seen that it's a new generation waiting. So the status quo at that time had a glide ratio of 4.8 maximum, and we had already 5.8 to 7. So we, we did some comparison flights where all uh, pilots flying with my wing had, play, had, had the first until the 10th place and then was the first professional pilot of LDK ranked. So the difference was already quite huge and clear. But as soon as the others were beginning to copy the distance, it was not so easy anymore to be a step ahead. But we, but we managed to be successful. In 93, we were winning the first time a big competition with the Europeans. With, uh, it was 94, it was Jimmy Bacher. It was one of, our, one of our juniors, you may know him. He won later again the Europeans, was World Cup winner. It's an Italian guy, a big, big talent. But even before, we built the first wing with diagonal ribs, which was successful. But we didn't win the World Cup, the World Championship at that time, even we tried hard. We had one proto who was dominant in matters of performance, 
but we wanted to have more than one pilot flying this wing in the World Championship. But the factory um, had some misunderstandings and they were sending us the first bunch of gliders with 1.4 millimeter lines in the top cascade instead of 0.4 millimeter lines. So we were just shocked and had to order new lines and had to replace lines and finally we were too late and only one pilot wanted to fly with the wing he didn't know at the World Championship. So it was a disaster from our side because we knew we, we, we should win it because we have the best wing, but we couldn't show it because we had problems. And yeah, but later on we were winning everything. So it was just, the start was a little bit delayed. You may say, here it's also the focus. Uh, it was an intermediate wing, which was a new development at that time, because at the beginning, every designer was focused on the high performance gliders. And as soon as the high performance gliders were a little bit outdated, you were using them for uh, intermediate pilots or even for schooling. Remember that the big X, once the hot chip of the champion got the school glider later. But the focus was especially uh, designed wing for intermediate pilots with reduced cell number and quite easy build up, but still good performing and good to fly in the SHV or AFNO version. The DHV version was shit because the DHV at that time had very st uh, strange and uh, hard rules to pass the Gütesiegel, the certification. So we had to castrate the wing to pass the tests and yeah, it was at that time already stupid because it was finally less safe than the open version because it was trimmed too slow. But everywhere else except Germany, we were selling the open version. I just selected some pictures here. In 89, we were able to build the legendary Xenon. You may remember the name. It was the first really, really fast gliding wing with 65 kilometers maximum speed around this. And we had fast wings before, but at that time minimum speed was not the discipline. So the fast gliding was uh, honored in 95. And yeah, we were once again not winning the world championship, but nearly everything else. I think we had double the points of the second place in the PWC and it was a, it was a little different time as today. Uh, the competition flying was in the focus of the public pilots and we had a sponsor, FDI Logbox, and were able to sponsor plenty of pilots traveling around the world, flying our wings. So it was a great time having lots of successes and nice competitions all over. So. David Dago was one of our junior pilots those, day, those days. So I know many, many of pilots just because they were once member of our team. And yeah, this is, this is a picture of the development stage of the Xenon in Monaco. The World Championship was early in the year, Japan in January, February, February. And so we had to develop the wing during winter or do the final changes during winter, which is very difficult because you have no real good thermals and it's cold outside, you cannot do some uh, outdoor work. So we were spending nearly the whole winter on, on the Cottosphere. This is already Mike King. And we knew that we have a special wing and it was a nice time. But we were very um, naive, maybe, because we thought that we could do the certification with this kind of glider. And after plenty of tests, Mike was jumping over the wing and had water landings and we tried hard, but we've seen that we, 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 we will fail. So we could not really uh, get this glider through the certification. We didn't try. We knew it in advance. And this was the beginning of the competition class, more or less, of the, open, of the of specially developed wings for a reduced number of pilots just for the comp pilots. So no serial certified gliders, because all the designs before, we, we were just flying comps with the serial canopies and with thin lines mounted with all the same trim. And now we had special gliders 
for for comps for the for the masses. So of course before it's just our own company pilots had protos, but now we had uh, an uncertified glider range for plenty of pilots. I think we sold three, four hundred of these Xenons and none of them had a certification. So we were spreading protos to plenty of pilots, which was new at that time. So it was the introduction of a, of a competition class, an uncertified competition class. But of course we wanted to have certify, a certified high performer. So we had to choose plan B and we were lucky because plan B was working from the, from the scratch. So the fir very first prototype showed very good results already. And finally the glider got the Xion, maybe you know it. So Steve Yu was, among the, was in the audience in London and he was flying it for years. He was calling it the, I the Iron Lion Xion. He was still uh, on top of performance and it was a big commercial success. I think we were selling 2,700 pieces around this. And yeah, I even made advertisings. So I, uh, a hobby of mine was to create computer graphics. So here you can see Mike Kung on a photo and the other side Mike Kung as a virtual uh, man and a rendered Xion even with, with pulled brakes. This was the advertising of 96 with no two-dimensional text. It was just a rendered scene calculated in the computer. So yeah, I did plenty of computer uh, yeah, calculations, so I was, I was quite enthusiastic about the possibilities you can do with these things. Yeah, we had, interesting wise, during the Xenon development, we had a prototype having aspect ratio 6. And we thought, ah, maybe it's too much for the comp pilots. We reduced the aspect ratio to 5.7 and we brought the aspect ratio 6 glider two years later, and it was still good enough to win the, double, to win the double PWC. So in comparison to today's uh, wings, aspect ratio 6 is like of a low level C wing, but the gliders of that days were quite flat. So the aspect ratio, the projected aspect ratio was already high. And you could see, I, can, I could make a drawing later here. Yeah, here. Uh, we, from very early, found a different kind of diagonal rib. So the very first glider we built with diagonals, yeah, it had already the classical diagonal built up, like this. We have suspension, diagonal, unsuspended ribs. Yeah. So this was the build up we were choosing, we were choosing for the very first glider but we found it to be quite heavy. And so very soon, so already on the serial produced wings, we were choosing a quite tricky build-up. We had, here you have three cells on top and three cells on bottom, and this is still the common one. So lots of, nearly all of the diagonal ribs gliders have uh, build, has a build-up build like that, some with some uh, four and five grew, uh, cell groups, but we were choosing a quite tricky build-up because we wanted to save weight. It was looking like that. So we had two cells on bottom and four cells on top. So it's a, a smooth top sail and the not so smooth bottom sail and one unsuspended rib less. And yeah, this was proven to be a successful technique. So we could, we could try it again. So it is still, I think, a, a good idea. You see here only a few cells on bottom, but plenty of cells on top. And yeah, so we were already optimizing the principal idea of having the diagonals. Uh, nowadays, it's possible to even have, con even have configurations 
like this. Nowadays we can already do things like that. So we have a normal diagonal supporting the next uh, rib, and then we can, ha we can we have a diagonal which is here crossing the the rib by having fingers leading through holes, and the same on this side. So we can finally have one, two, three, four, five cells between two suspensions which is saving line meters, but is adding some complexity. And this is at the moment sort of the status, the status quo. But in my special uh, way to have these fingers, I can show you later. So the type of diagonals we were choosing at that time was, was this type. And we were using it until 2001 or 2002. And then we were switching back to the to the old way, but yeah, maybe it's, it will, we will see a comeback of this kind of diagonal construction. In '99, we finally managed to win the World Championship, but it was a quite frustrating event. It was in Salzburg. We were, oh, it, looked, it looked like we were the biggest manufacturer of the world among, after 10 years of existence of existence, we were selling more than 3,000 gliders per year and were sponsoring the whole event. And, but it was frustrating because we had two weeks of rainy weather and nearly no tasks. And after this, we decided to step out of the competition scene and focus on normal gliders for normal intermediate pilots because we were winning everything and knew how it felt and had polished our egos and yeah, finally you have to do, you have to make a change. So it's, it's still a reason because it, it might be a reason why some brands tr try to be engaged in the comp scene, they just want to, want to be someone and we have I think proven to be somebody and, and wanted to do two choice, to have different, uh, to go in a different direction, but we still stayed competitive and had the focus on performance. So in 2003 we had, for example, a world record on a serial glider, on a certified serial glider, 278 kilometers in Brazil with the Aeron, which was the DHV2 glider at that time but quite optimized for performance. So I had the reputation to design gliders which were good in performance, but quite bad in handling. But in the meanwhile, I hope I have, I will, I'm getting good feedback regarding the handling of my wings as well. Yeah, and then a new kind of competition was coming up. It was the time of the online contests. They began, yeah, maybe 2007, 8, 9, something. And these were distance flying disciplines, and they're still, still very popular, you know. And the, the competition were fly, were, this competition was, fl was flown by, with normal serial paragliders of uh, several classes, and it was a very good idea as normal pilots could see the performance of the gliders they are able to fly and I got specialized in the intermediate class uh, 1 to 2 later it got high B and we were unbeaten for a long time uh, it was a big bonus of ours that the magazine, a German magazine, an Austrian magazine writing in German, the Thermik or Gleitsche magazine, they did glide comparisons of all the wings. I didn't know. I don't know if you had, if you got these numbers. So they were testing all the wings and made some measurements of glide ratio, and we always managed to be on top in our in this class. And as soon as the competitors came close to us, we did the next step. So we were every time. Uh, leading and had very good success in sales 
especially because of also in this OLC result lists we were always on, on, on top and winning this kind of class. And there is another story you may remember. This is, this is the next picture. As the Mentor 2 came on the market, we, did, we, had, we were quite lucky uh, regarding a, a story that was the following. It was the time Ozone brought the Delta 1. You remember it was really a step forward in performance. And we thought, how could we uh, react? Should we compete in the C class like the Delta? But then we thought, no, we try to offer nearly the same performance in a lower class, in the B class. And we succeeded. So the glider was really performing extraordinary because especially for high speed gliding, aspect ratio is not necessary. Aspect ratio is there for reducing the, uh, the drag by having high lift situations, the induced drag. But when you have a low lift situation like fast gliding, high aspect ratio is contraproductive because it, the wingspan has to support it by lines. So a paraglider with high aspect ratio always suffers from the line drag. And the computer models already existed at that time predicted that low aspect ratio concepts with very, very reduced line setup will perform better in fast gliding. And so I did a lot of optimizations in the computer design phases. And finally, uh, Glider really showed the performance predicted. We had some, yeah, we had some work on the step below to get a really clean shape. And as we did some internal comparisons, we found, or we, we experienced, that the Mentor 2 was even outgliding an uh, actual END wing just of advance, which is getting funny as I've been working for advance three, some years later. So, and, but we couldn't publish it. Of course, I couldn't publish. You could, you could outglide the advance high performance data with our B wing. But I was writing in the forum, you could even beat an actual END wing with the Mentor 2. So without telling which glider it was. But the forum members were kicking me because it was unbelievable and they thought I'm just spreading fake news. So fake news were at that time not as common as today. And one of those, uh, I always forget the name, Carlo. Tom Payne. Yeah, Tom Payne, right. <laughs> he was attacking me a lot. And okay, then we said, good Tom, I don't is, do, do you call bluff? What's bluff in German? I say bluff. So when you, when you do some poker games and you... Bluff. bluff. I don't bluff. I can prove it. And so finally we had to tell which glider it was and we had the shootout gliding in San Helier. And the, the deal was, in the case I was wrong, he could shit on me on the forum. <laughs> and in the case I was right, he told me he will invent me for a glass of beer, but I told him, no, I don't drink beer. He can spend me a glass of milk. And as you see on this picture, we won the comparison. <laughs> and yeah, the scene was impressed. It was a perfect marketing um, opportunity. Opportunity, yeah. We, we've chosen the opportunity. The marketing was perfect. Everyone knew about the performance of the glider. Advance was blamed, which was the pity. I didn't want to have it or to reach this effect. And yeah, we sold plenty of this wing and even so the successor, the Mentor 3, was a big, big success. But since the Mentor 3, I was not anymore able to build a high B because I was working for Advance and maybe they didn't want to want me to build another one of those to prevent uh, me blaming them again. But I did it now. So now with the Maestro, I have made the successor of the Mentor 3.